came to church, right? Ooh. Hey, well, welcome everybody to Westminster Presbyterian Church on this wonderful and fabulous Sunday uh, where we get to come before our Lord and King and worship Him as our Lord and Savior. Uh, my name is Mike Sedgwick. I'm the pastor here. I want to welcome all of you here in person and also for those of you who are joining us online. We are so grateful that you are spending this time with us as well. Uh, a couple quick announcements I have. First, in the pew racks in front of you are our Connect cards. We would encourage you to fill one of those out. Whether it's your first time, first time in a long time, or you just want to let us know that you are here, we would appreciate that. Uh, we promise if you put your cell phone or email down, we won't sign you up for anything that you don't want to be signed up for. We just like to welcome you. Uh, and then in addition to that, below are the prayer section, where if you have any prayer requests or prayer praises that you want to share with our prayer team, we would love to be praying uh, for you as well. Uh, well, obviously, it's the last Sunday of the month, and our orchestra is here. Can we give orchestra and choir a thank you for joining us today? Uh, we have a new thing that we are debuting today, and that is a set of timpani drums uh, over here, which is wonderful. There it is. I'm glad he didn't do the da dun -tsh. That's for Kurt in the back, I guess, to do. Uh, you know, what's really neat is you, many of you may remember Pat Sands, our dearly loved sister. Uh, when, she, when the Lord took her home to heaven, one of the things she did was that she tithed off of her estate, meaning that of her whole estate, she said, I want some of this to go to the church to support worship and music ministries here. And we talked with Pat's daughter and uh, one of the things that we had really wanted to do was to purchase this timpani set. And so we are thrilled that every time uh, we bring this out, it is in honor of Pat. And so, Pat, if you're watching, we hope you have a great seat and enjoy. Uh, so a couple other quick announcements is don't forget on Wednesday nights, we are watching the show The Chosen here at the church. Uh, you can watch this for home, at home if you want to, but it's really fun to watch it together. As a reminder, we meet just around 5.30 depending on how slow or fast you eat in the fellowship hall for dinner. It is a bring-your-own dinner. Um, and then at 6 o'clock, we come up here and we start watching one episode of The Chosen. They're about 45 to 50 minutes long. Uh, this last episode we watched was Jesus at the wedding in Cana, uh, where he turns water into wine, which was so much fun to watch. Uh, you know, it's like Jesus danced, and you're like, hey, he's, that's cool. He goes to weddings and he celebrates. And this coming week, we're watching one of my favorite miracles that takes place. Uh, it's a healing, and so if you want to join us, 6 o'clock, you can do that. If you've already seen it and want to watch it again, that's okay, too. Uh, in addition to that, we have Vacation Bible School coming up, which is two of our favorite things, uh, Jesus and Legos, right? So uh, we are thrilled to be able to offer this to the community. Uh, we can hold about 100 kids at this point. Um, and so we are very thrilled to be able to do that. We have these cards in case you want to take one and pass it out and invite somebody. In addition to that, on July 3rd, we will have a Vacation Bible School Build Week. And so we'll take the 4th of July off, but on starting on July 3rd, we are going to transform this sanctuary into a very fun Lego set with about a million and a half of the boxes that you all donated and brought. Um, and so we just need people to help build. And so if you want to come down and use industrial-sized hot glue guns and paint and make a VBS set that looks like Legos, including tunnels and all kinds of fun stuff, we would love to have you come and be able to do that. In addition to that, we're, doing, we're trying to do something we've never done before. Uh, we have some families here in our church and some people in our community uh, with children with special needs, that they are somewhere on the autistic spectrum. And we don't want to uh, disclude them, whatever that word is, right? We want to include them and allow children and families to be able to participate. Uh, but it's very different because oftentimes it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Sometimes it's a two-adults-to-one kid ratio, depending on their needs. And so if you have a calling or a desire to help with special needs ministry, especially for Vacation Bible School, uh, we would love for you to be able to sign up for that as well. And then our children's ministry has a wonderful group of volunteers, but is also looking for substitutes. So if you would be willing to be on a substitute list, that if someone goes on vacation or calls in sick and says, I'll do it, I'll fill in, 
uh, we're signing up for that as well. So there will be a sign-up list here in the back of the sanctuary. It was down at Fellowship before, but I think it's going to move up here. Um, In addition to that, next week is July 2nd, and we're going to be having our July 2nd church barbecue that we want to invite you to. Uh, It'll be really fun. We're having one service at 10 a.m., so if you show up next week at 11, you will show up just in time for the barbecue, which I know that might be tempting, but we are going to include you to come to church ahead of time at 10 a.m., so there'll just be one service. Uh, We have a special band coming in that's going to play some bluegrass gospel music uh, that'll be really fun. The place will be rocking, and then afterwards we'll go out and have a wonderful barbecue. In your bulletin is a list of items that we're asking you to bring. Uh, We're very blessed that uh, the I'm family here in the church is providing all of the hot dogs and hamburgers, so it's just sides for all of us. Uh, So that's a couple things happening, but one last thing I wanted to mention is that our mission committee, whenever we have some of our mission partners come into town, we like to make sure that you can meet them. Uh, they, so the Ringenbergs happen to be in town this week, and we are thrilled uh, that they spent about 45 minutes down in the fellowship hall, and they're going to come up here. I'll invite them up to come forward and share a little bit about. So can we uh, welcome the Ringenbergs from Mission Aviation Fellowship? <laughs> Dave, thank you for being here today. Um, go ahead, take it away. Right, thank you, Pastor Mike. You know, I'm Dave Ringenberg, this is my wife Linda, and our son Ryan, and I'm a pilot with MAF. We've been with MAF for about 26 years now, and um, our vision in MAF is to see isolated people changed by the love of Christ. And I noticed in your bulletin you have a, a vision statement in there as well, so it's good that you have that as a, as a direction, as a guide. I don't want to steal your sermon, Pastor, but it's good <laughs> stuff, really good. And, uh, and so we just want to take the opportunity to say thank you for your, your support, your prayer support, your financial support. Uh, it just doesn't happen. We're not isolated out there. We need your support. And so uh, to be effective in what we do, uh, with the airplane, uh, we, we are just so grateful to have you uh, along our side. And so um, one of the things that we, we like to, to support is translation work. And, uh, and so we partner with um, different organizations that do a, a great job in doing that. And so if you'd like to learn more about what we do, please see us afterwards. We're going to be around uh, after church and whatnot. And so uh, come see us. We have a sign-up sheet for our a newsletter, and we have a prayer card if you would like one of those too. So once again, thank you, and God bless you guys. Thank you, Dave. Before you go, before you go, uh, about uh, eight months ago, we watched the movie To the Ends of the Earth. You may remember that. We had a screen so big, it hit those speakers when we were set, setting it up. And we watched that show, To the Ends of the Earth, and this is a great thing that the Ringenbergs have taken that call and that command from Christ that the gospel would be preached here and then also to the very ends of the earth. And so they are doing that. Uh, One of the things we want to do is pray for you all here at the second service. Um, And it's a call not only for the Ringenbergs, right? It's just because they're doing it doesn't mean we get to say, oh, good, someone's doing it. It's a call to all of us to follow Christ, to go and preach the gospel. And so one of the things that's really good is that we support them, but also it will challenge us in the way that God may be moving us to go and share the gospel to the very ends of the earth as well. So it's our tradition here at the church that when we're commissioning and praying for people, rather than all of us gathering around and placing a hand on them, we lift a hand over them. So I'd invite you to just lift a hand in prayer with me as we pray for them. And so, Heavenly Father, we do thank you and we praise you, Lord, that as you called out, who will go, who shall I send, that this family said, we will go. We will go to the very ends of the earth. And so, Lord Jesus, we thank you um, for Dave, Linda, and Ryan, Lord. And we praise you that they are fulfilling the great commission to go and bring the good news. We, We are so grateful. And how precious are the feet and the wings, Lord, that bring the gospel of Jesus to those who are so thirsty for your word. And Lord Jesus, we just ask a prayer of blessing over uh, protection uh, as they go out and do ministry, Lord, that you would protect them. We thank you for your provision and pray that you would continue to bless them with that. And Lord, most of all, we thank you for the message of the pardon of our sin through Jesus Christ that they bring. Lord, Father, we thank you so much for them and we lift them up to you and pray that you would inspire us to go as they have gone as well. We give you great thanks and we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, thank you all very much.
Let's give them a hand. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, I would invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymns.
morning, everybody. Great to see you here on this beautiful day. Please take a few moments to greet each other. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here with all this amazing music to raise our praises. Please join with me in prayer. From Psalm 145, great is the Lord, greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. We cannot know all of who you are, Lord, the extent of your greatness, but we meditate on your word and your power and majesty. We praise you for your wondrous works in creation for music, for the vastness of space, for the beauty we see. We praise you, God, for your wondrous plan of salvation, the miracle of the resurrection, and your faithfulness through all time. You are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. From everlasting to everlasting, you have no beginning and no end, yet you see each of our future days ahead of us, you know them. You know the path you have for us, a path with you, toward you. And we thank you, Jesus, for, for being near to all who call on you, who call on you in truth with a humble heart, knowing that you are God and we need you, Lord. So we confess we have not always called on you. We often think we know better than you what our future should hold. Forgive our pride, Jesus. We pray for your justice to be done, yet we often fail to do the just and right thing. We confess we have not always defended the weak and the voiceless. Forgive our apathy. Teach us humility to seek your ways and your will above our own. And hear us in a moment of quiet, personal confession. We thank you, God, that you loved us first, that you sent Jesus to save us. And Jesus, you put yourself in our place to receive our punishment. We thank you for your grace that covers all of our sins. Thank you for hearing our cries for mercy and saving us. You truly are gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And out of love, we lift up in prayer, those on our hearts and minds in need of your healing today. We pray for those nearing the end of life on earth, and God, we ask that you would give them a new awareness of your presence, give your comfort and strength to them and their loved ones. Today, we lift up and pray for Dora Lou Hansen and ask God that you would surround this sweet servant of yours with your peace. We pray for those facing medical and emotional struggles. God, pour out your healing for bodies and minds. Bring wholeness according to your perfect will. We honor the request to pray for those in our military with ties to our congregation. This week we lift up by name Ryan and Morgan Charles, Mitchell Guthrie and Brandon, Pe Brandon Penner. In your mercy, Jesus, protect them. We pray for those who have answered your call to go to the ends of the earth to make you known, Jesus. And this week we ask your blessing on the Ringenberg family and that you would multiply their efforts with Mission Aviation Fellowship to share your grace and your truth to the ends of the earth. God, give courage to all who may be in danger as they faithfully serve you, Jesus. And we pray today for our junior and senior high students going to camp this week and ask Holy Spirit that you would move in their hearts. Use this time away in a transfor transformational way, Lord, that only you can to impact your kingdom. Lord, you are the one who upholds all who are falling and you raise up all who are bowed down. 
So Lord, we pray for the world. We pray that you would uphold those who are in need and you would defend those who have been put down. We pray that your peace would prevail, Lord. Not peace as the world gives, but your peace of soul. We pray today for those in war-torn regions, for their safety, and mostly for their peace with you, God. We pray for brutal leaders to be brought down low and for humble, compassionate leaders to be raised up. We pray for hearts to turn from darkness and self-focus to you, Jesus. Do what only you can do, Lord, in your grace and in your mercy. We put our trust in you, and we join together to pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
To know and to follow the will of God has been the heart's desire of people down through the ages. David said, teach me to do thy will. The Bible teaches that God has a plan for every life and that if we live in constant fellowship with him, he will direct us and lead us into the fulfillment of this plan. There are many Christians who have only God's second or third best. They have substituted the good for the best. They have missed God's perfect plan for their lives. To know the will of God is the highest of all wisdom. God does not reveal his will through fortune tellers or soothsayers or workers of hocus pocus. His will is made known to those who have trusted Christ for salvation. He shares this secret only with those who are redeemed and transformed by Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches that God has a plan for your life. Well, I kind of think we should open all sermons with Billy Graham, don't you think? I mean, every time I'm like, wow. Uh, well, here's what I want you to do is I want you to open your Bibles. If you brought them, wonderful. If not, there are Bibles right underneath the seat you are seated in. And I want you to open your Bible to the book of Nehemiah. And the reason why I've asked you to open it now is because Nehemiah is a difficult book to find, and it might take you the entire time until we actually start reading from it to find it, uh, which will be in a bit, so you have some time. But you know, it's important to know the names in the Bible, especially the books of the Bible that begin with a first name, because you might meet them in heaven one day, and you don't want to embarrass yourself by walking up and Hi, I'm Nehemiah. Oh, were you one of the disciples? No. You know, it will enhance your experience in heaven if we get there uh, to know all of these people. So, again, Nehemiah, there's also a table of contents in the beginning if that will help you. So, as we begin, this is our, uh, last, ser- our last message in the series of Discovering God's Will. And I wanted to give you a quick review, and it's going to start in the form of a quiz for those of you who have been here and heard parts of this. Uh, God reveals His will through Scripture in multiple different ways. Uh, The first way which we discovered is what? God's providential will. That's right, God's providential will. And remember, those are the things that God is just going to do, no matter what. It is His will. He is God. We are not. It doesn't take any of our input. He just decided, this is what I'm going to do. So that's God's providential will. The second one we learned was called what? God's moral will. Very good. And God's moral will is all about the shoulds and should not do's in Scripture. God's desire is that all of humanity would follow the commands in His moral will found in Scripture. And just for imagine for a moment, if everyone on earth followed God's moral will for one month, good month or bad month? Amazing month, right? I mean, it would transform this world if we all followed God's moral will. And so remember that on one side, it's almost like guardrails on the road. We have God's providential will over here, and over here we have God's moral will, and that helps us to discover the third one, which is what? God's personal will, which is God's personal will for your life, which is what we're all after. We all want to know that. God, what is your will for my life? And then through that, some of the primary tools that God uses to give us His will is the first is that when we seek wise Christian counsel, go and ask other more mature Christians who are down the road that God can speak through them to give us wise counsel and help discern His will. And then last week we talked about this as well, that when we, the other primary tool that God uses is the Word of God in the Scripture that there are principles throughout Scripture that are foundational and so wonderfully and practical, so wonderfully practical for us in our lives. And last week we talked about the one that's very simple, you should, you reap what you sow, to which we all say, well, I don't need to go to church to know that. Exactly. It is a principle. And who do you think established that principle? the honorable G-O-D, right? And so, as a result of that, we have the providential will of God, the moral will of God, and to help discern the personal will of God for our lives, we look at wise counsel, we look at Scripture, 
And today, we're going to talk about the last one here. And today is such a huge subject that this could go on for weeks, but we don't have that time. We only have today to go and talk about another facet of God's will that is often overlooked, and yet it's so practical and so simple when we explain it. Interestingly enough, when I start talking about this, this might not seem like a way that God actually would reveal His will to our lives. It might even seem a little bit like a selfish endeavor, like this is just the desires of my heart. But as we dig and as we go through this, you will see that if it's used in the right context, that God uses this in a powerful, powerful way. So today's subject is we're talking about vision, vision. One of the primary ways God will guide you and direct you in your life is by giving you a big picture vision in your life. And the clearer the vision, I'll say this about 50 times, the clearer the vision, the fewer the options you have, and the easier it is to make decisions in your life. Now, a vision is basically a destination, a preferred destination, a, a, a place you want to end up in life, a place that God wants you to end up in, a destination God wants you to be in. And I'm not talking about a, one particular vision here. I'm talking about a multifaceted, big vision that God has for the totality of your life, a picture of what God wants to see happen in your life, maybe in your marriage, in relationships with your family, a picture of what God wants, you to, wants to see in your life professionally, with your finances, with your health, relationships, a place that God wants to see your faith grow, your ministry to take place, how to disciple and be discipled. You know, the Ringenbergs were here in church at first service and shared about the vision that God has given them to go to the ends of the earth. So even that, in mission, God has a vision for you. Vision is simply this, what could be fueled by what should be. Could be fueled by what should be. So here's what I want you to do today, is to begin thinking in terms of, Lord, what is the big picture for my life? Lord, what is the big picture for my marriage? God, what do you see down the road for me in terms of my relationship with my children? God, give me a vision of where I need to be financially, where I need to be in relationships, where I need to be professionally. It's a mental picture of what could be and what you believe should be in each of those areas. I can see the glazed look on all your faces, so let me give you an example. Have you ever tried to do a puzzle? without the lid of the puzzle box, right? Now, I realized at this moment that for the second service in a row, I left my puzzle box in the office. So I'm just going to have to, have, you're going to have to imagine it. But imagine dumping out all of the puzzle pieces and having no understanding of what the picture is or where any piece could go. And the reality is that's what happens in our life when we don't have the picture of what could be and should be. Because I know how you all do puzzles. You instantly look at the picture, and you say, this is what it should be. And then as you see pieces, you begin to understand the places of where they are going to end up. And what I have discovered is that as you develop a clearer and clearer picture, it makes putting the pieces together so much easier in life. But if you don't have that lid, puzzles are exceptionally challenging, as is life. And so what I have discovered is that when I put the providential will of God over here to make sure I am not disobeying that and I am in line with what God is doing in this world, and on the other side, I put the moral will of God as guardrails, and then in search of my personal will of God for me, with the counsel of other believers, and by looking at the principles from the Word of God in the Scriptures, that suddenly you begin to see a picture of where God wants to en you to end up, and He's put a lot of these desires in your heart already, 
And suddenly, you're able to make decisions and understand God's will so much easier in your life. Here's another illustration that will be very practical. Is what if after this service we said, hey, let's all go to lunch, right? Now, what's the most common question asked when you're going to go out to eat? Where do you want to go, right? Now, if, you know, that's the first question. And if we just said, let's go out to eat at a restaurant, the options are kind of unlimited, right? I mean, it's like a million options that we could go. But what if I said, well, you know what? I want to go have tacos. Well, because we live in Escondido, instead of millions, now we've, you know, narrowed it down to about 5,000, right? 5,000 places that we could go get tacos. But what if I began to paint a clearer picture? Because down in Takati, there is the best street tacos you can possibly buy, a place that I love to go every chance I can. And what if we all got our passports and we all said, we're all going to the taco shop in Takati, the longest caravan to ever cross the Takati border at one time. We're all going, let's go. You would have a very clear picture of where we are going to end up, right? But let me tell you what happens. In, in directions, it's so obvious. And in hiking, it's so obvious. But we have a tendency to forget this in the rest of the areas of our life. So if we all have our passports, we all go out and get our cars, and we're going down to Mexico in Takati, and we all come out and we get on the 15 north, will we ever get there? Now, I know at the first service, someone said, eventually, okay, it always happens. Someone thinks you can drive, you know, Oregon, Washington, and then you're like going through Canada, and you, somehow you cross the North Pole in your car, you know, and then through the oceans and through the south, you know, it's not going to happen, right? But let me ask you this. What if we hope we get there? I really hope we get to Mexico as we're driving on the 15 North to Temecula. Are we going to get there? What if we wish? Are we going to get there? No. What if, we, what if we tell everybody we know, guess what, we're going to Mexico, but we drive on the 15 North. Will we ever get there? Here's the kicker. What if we prayed? Lord, would you please give us safe travels, surround us with a hedge of protection as we drive to Mexico as we are now on the way out to Vegas. That should be a red flag. Will we ever get there? What's the only thing we can do? Turn around. Now, there's a sermon on repentance. We'll do another time. But here's the reality, is that it's so obvious in driving directions. It's so obvious when we go for hikes and walks. If we know where we want to go, we walk in that direction. And yet, we have a tendency to forget this and say, oh, I really want a good marriage. I really want this part of my life. I think God wants this for me. And yet, we walk in another direction direction. It makes no sense. You know, for some of, some of our younger students we had at the first service or in here, you know, there might be a time when you're like, oh, I want to date somebody, right? I want to date somebody. Now, if you came to me and said, hey, I want to date somebody, I would ask you the question, what does dating look like to you? I'm going to help you paint a picture. What does dating look like? Describe that to me. And the reason why I would say that is because as you begin to paint a picture of dating, suddenly you're going to narrow down your options. And that toxic, creepy person won't be part of your dating life. But if you don't have a vision of where you are supposed to go, they very well might end up in your life. Another common one for single adults, I want to be married. To who? I don't care. I just want to be married. That's not a good vision. That's not a clear picture of where you are trying to end up. And guaranteed, you will most likely find yourself married one day to the toxic creeper, quite possibly, because you never had a direction. But as soon as you define what marriage would look like, what it would feel like, what the description of it is, as you begin to paint a picture of a vision from God, being mindful of the providential will of God and the moral will of God, seeking wise counsel. Hey, how did you get your marriage to work? How did you meet? What did you do? And then looking at the principles of Scripture, you are going to narrow your options 
to where so many people are no longer in that path for you. The clearer the vision, the easier it is to evaluate the options. And why? Because there is a picture, a destination of where you are headed. So, what I want you to begin to think about is what is the picture that God has put on your heart for your life, for relationships, for marriage, for your children, for finances, for you professionally, for you serving in the church to be in part of God's kingdom? What is the vision that God has put for you as far as mission is involved here at the church? God, help me to see what you see. I want a biblical view of my marriage, a God-driven view of my relationship with my kids. Heavenly Father, what picture do you have for me in all of these key areas of my life? And if you begin making decisions from that perspective, with those guardrails, determining God's will for your life becomes so much easier. Here's how Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, put it in Proverbs. He said this, where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Gosh, that's what I just, I could have just put that verse up and it would have solved it, right? Where there is no vision, no picture of a destination, you might end up anywhere. You might say, this is so cool. <laughs> I want my marriage to be great. I want my spouse to know I love her, but here I am driving on the 15 to Canada. You know, I don't even know how far the 15 goes up but we find ourselves going in the wrong direction. And if you could just end up anywhere if we live unrestrained. So instead, we are to have vision. This is how Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. Right after talking about all these things, he says, don't worry saying what will we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear. I know this is another message, but those are good things you know, to think about. And what is Jesus saying? He says, if that becomes your primary focus, your vision, you're going to miss what I have for you. He says the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows you need them. But he says that instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Put God's view for your life first and foremost, and all these things will be given to you as well. That doesn't mean you get a lot of stuff. That means you're going to have the right priorities and the right destination so that you end up in the places where God wants you to be. So today we're looking at the book of Nehemiah, finally. Did you find it, Nehemiah? You got your thumb in it, maybe? We're not there yet. I highly recommend reading the book of Nehemiah if you've never read it. There's a little caveat, though. You need to read the book of Ezra and then the book of Nehemiah. The two go together. And I'm just going to give you a little bit of warning there's three main sections that are in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, and each one of them ends with a downer. I mean, it's just a downer. But if you like stories about people pulling people's hair to try to get them to do the right thing, you'll love the book of Nehemiah. It's great. But those downers, they all point to Jesus. They all talk about the need for our coming king. So one of the greatest moments in Nehemiah is I want this to become your battle cry. I want this phrase that we'll put up here, we'll say it a bunch, I want this to be your battle cry in your house, with your children, with your marriage, with your faith, and it could become the standard for decision-making in your home, and it has to do with God's vision for your life. So if you've never read Nehemiah, a couple little things to know about him. Israel was told that if they don't get things right, God will judge them and send them into exile for 70 years. And that's exactly what happened, that the nation of Israel was judged by God, and the Babylonians came in and wiped out Israel. I mean, they wiped them out, and they made all of them prisoners and slaves. And so, uh, Nehemiah finds himself as the cupbearer to the king. It's the, and this king, his predecessor, is the one who went in and destroyed everything in Jerusalem. But God had said that after 70 years, He's going to begin to bring the people back to their land. And so that's exactly what happens. In the book of Ezra, some of the Israelites go back and they rebuild the temple. 
And then more Israelites go back and they start establishing an economy and they begin to uh, restart the teaching of the Torah, the law of God, and all these good things are happening. And meanwhile, Nehemiah is still held as a prisoner or as a slave to the king. And God gives Nehemiah a burden. God raises a concern within Nehemiah. He gives him a vision that something needs to happen, something needs to change. And God gives Nehemiah a vision for the walls of Jerusalem to be rebuilt. He says, this is not right. We need walls around Jerusalem. So this is about 400 B.C., and Nehemiah gets the opportunity to go back and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. The problem is that he hits all kinds of issues. All sorts of problems begin to arise, mostly other nations and leaders. Uh, this is also where the hair-pulling incident begins to take place. But he's threatened. He's threatened with military power. Stop building these walls because all of the surrounding nations and leaders are threatened by these walls. If you build these walls, Nehemiah, this is going to become a military stronghold, and we don't want that. And so, this is where we find ourselves in Nehemiah chapter 6. So you'll have to flip a couple pages over there if you found Nehemiah. And this is, the, they've come to the conclusion there is no way to stop the wall. So what must we do? This is the conclusion of all of these threats as they've tried to distract him and threaten him. Here's what they do. So it says, when the word came to Sanballat, and Sanballat is the main bad guy. I mean, it even sounds like the name of a bad guy, right? When the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies that I had rebuilt the wall and not a gap was left in it. Again, this is being written by Nehemiah. Though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, very specific. He says, Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. Now when I read this, I get a kick out of this. I, this is how I read it. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. You should never establish a meeting in a place called Ono, right? You should never. It's like when my mom bought a, a Chevy Nova, not the cool old kind, the new kind, you know, and then it means no go in Spanish. And they're like, how come it's not selling in Spanish, right? No go. You don't buy a car that's called no go, and you don't make a military meeting in a place called oh no. You just don't. And so here's what happened. All of a sudden, all of these other leaders, they realize they can't stop the wall. We've threatened him. We've threatened him with military action. And now it looks like the best thing to do is to trick the leader, bring him out to the plain of Ono, and just kill him. Just take out the leader. So it's about 20 miles north of the city, and the idea that they kind of set it up is, hey, we're going to be neighbors now. Yeah, we've had some problems in the past, but let's make a treaty. Let's, make a, let's come to an agreement so that we can appreciate each other, right? It'll be a good thing. But the truth is they had no intention of doing that, and Nehemiah knew that. In verse 2, he says, but they were scheming to harm me. And this is the part that I love. I'll explain it more. So Nehemiah, he sent messengers to them with this reply. I am carrying on a great project, and I cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? So that's his response. And then, of course, four times they sent the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. So the idea, the picture is this. Nehemiah, like up on a ladder, supervising, working, and this messenger comes, hey, Nehemiah, Nehemiah, we got a message from Sanballat, your enemy. He wants you to meet him in the plains of Ono. Do you want to go? No, I don't. I'm not going to go. I'm doing something important here. I am working on something. I cannot go down to them. Five times they do this. And the significance and the context of Nehemiah is that Nehemiah clearly knows that God has called him to do something. God has given him a picture, a vision 
of what to do. And anything that contributes to the building of that wall is a yes. And anything that distracts him from that vision is a no. Because the picture was from God. Decision-making was very easy for Nehemiah. Here's how the NASB puts it. It says, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Let's say that together. I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. One more time with conviction. Now do it like you mean it. I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. You know what I find myself doing over and over and over again in my life? When I think about what God wants for my family, when I think about what God wants for my marriage, when I think about what God wants for my kids and my relationship with my kids, when I think about what God wants for me and my health, physically, mentally, emotionally, when I think about what God wants for me in this church, over and over and over again, I have distractions. And I tell myself this. I am doing a great work. I cannot come down and do that. No matter what the distraction, I am doing a great work. I cannot come down. I cannot leave that. Decision-making begins to be easier. When you have a vision from God, you have fewer options and the decision is easier. And in every area of your life, when you give God the opportunity to show you what could be, fueled by what should be, decision-making gets easier. Some of you need to apply this phrase in your marriage. Your buddy calls you up, Hey, you want to do 72 holes of golf today? <laughs> and you're looking at your wife, and she goes, Hey, are we going to spend the day together? You tell your buddy, I am doing great work. I cannot come down and golf 72 holes with you. To which one of our golfers at the first service said, You know, Mike, sometimes going and golfing 72 hours is the great work so that your marriage will thrive. Okay, you figure it out for yourself. But some of you need to tell your buddies that for your marriage. Some of you need to tell your work that for your marriage. I am doing a great work at home. I cannot come over today. I need to set that boundary. Some of us need to tell that to our phones and our computers, right? Hey, look at me. I am doing a great work with my marriage. I cannot come down. I cannot do that today. In every area of your life, you need to shift the priorities and see your marriage as great work that God has put in your life. For some of you, you need to do it with your children or grandchildren. Those distractions that come up, you need to say, gosh, that would be fun, but instead I'm going to do this great work in my kids. This is my great work that God has put in my life. I cannot come over. I cannot do that. For some of you, it's serving God's kingdom. God has given you a vision of how he wants to serve, and you keep putting it off and be distracted. And, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm not skilled. I can't do that. And he says, I, I have given you great work. And we need to put away those other things. Uh, many years ago, I had just finished wrapping up a job at a church. And thankfully... Soon after I left the church, the church had a split in leadership. This church stayed where it was, and this church went and planted a new church. And it was funded by very wealthy people. And they called me. My wife Sarah and I, we had just moved up to Pasadena. I was starting seminary. I was like, hey, this is my vision, is that we're going to finish seminary, start a family, all those good things. See where the Lord calls us. Calls us. And somebody called me and said, hey, Mike, we're starting a new church, and we want to hire you. And I'll tell you, I mean, I was like, whoa, that's, I was, you know, I was kind of like humbled and also very excited. And the pay that they were willing to throw down, I was kind of like, whoa, that's like more than I've ever made. 
mean, it was very tempting. And, they, and I was like, well, I just moved up to seminary. And they were like, hey, don't worry about that. We'll move you back down, and then you can commute. We'll even help you get a car that helps with commuting. And I was like, wow, this is really tempting. This could be real. I mean, it's a great opportunity for me and my family. There's only one problem. God had given my wife and I a vision, a picture of our future. And moving back down to San Diego wasn't part of it. And so I told them, I am doing a great work, and I cannot come down. That's our war cry, that the things that God has put in our life that are important, and He says, I want you to walk towards this. This is my vision for you. Get towards it. We need to begin to shed off those things that easily entangle and run with perseverance the race that Christ has marked out for us. So in closing, I want us to do three things. Three things. Number one, start praying that God would give you a vision in the key areas of your life. God, what is your preferred future for my marriage? God, what is your preferred future for my children and my relationship with my children? God, what is your preferred future for my health? I mean, this one is so practical, right? If you're like, I want to drop 20 pounds, and there's McDonald's, the decision-making becomes easy, doesn't it? I cannot come. I'm doing a great work. I cannot come into your drive through right? It becomes easy. The, deci- the options are narrower. Begin praying. God, give me a vision for my life in these key areas. The next one, unfortunately, many of you aren't going to do, but hopefully by me saying that, you will do it. Write it down. It doesn't have to be a journal that you spend for months doing. It could be a sentence. It could be a paragraph. Write it down. Put it somewhere. I'll tell you my five. You can steal them. They're very simple. My five, I've, I've lived by this for some years now. Number one, I want to be a good follower of Jesus Christ. That means if I want a good, strong relationship with Christ, when I wake up in the morning, I have a couple of options, right? I can sit and stare at my phone. I can be distracted and do other things. Or I can read my my scriptures and pray. One of those is going to get me to the destination. The others are not. That's number one. I want to be a good follower of Jesus. Number two is I want to be a good husband, right? Simple sentence. I want to be a good husband. My decision-making is very easy. Does this, does this make me a good husband? If the answer is no, I cannot do that. I cannot come down. I am doing great work. If it helps in marriage, yes, I can do that. I want to be a good father is number three. I want to be a good father to my kids. One of my goals in life for my children is that I want them to want to be around me when they don't have to be around me anymore. That as they get older, they get married, they have kids, that they'll be like, we want to go see grandma and grandpa. Yeah, let's go. That's one of my goals. Number four is I want to be in good health, mentally, physically, emotionally. And number five is I want to be a good steward of this church. That's what I want. Those are my five. When I, that's, that's my decision-making rubric. That's how I set up everything, and it's that simple. So write it down. And number three is so simple. Act accordingly. If you're going to say you're going to go in that direction, let's start walking in that direction. So I'm going to encourage every single person here to do those three things. Pray, God, give me a vision, your vision for my life in these key areas. Write them down and then say, now I'm going to walk in that direction. The minute we go for tacos in Takati and you get on the 15 North, We aren't acting accordingly. Isn't that so great? Isn't that such a simple, practical way to pursue after God's vision? Keeping in mind God's providential will for our lives, being aware of God's moral will. He won't break any of those things in finding your personal will. Seeking wise counsel, learning from the principles found in Scripture, and walking towards the vision that God has given you. The clearer that picture the fewer the options, 
and the easier it is going to be to live a life that glorifies God and brings you to the places that God wants you to be. Amen? Let me pray for us. So, Heavenly Father, I give you great thanks for this morning. Lord, I thank you that in front of us, this orchestra is an example of walking towards a preferred destination. Lord, that if we want to be able to play an instrument, we got to walk towards that direction. we got to practice. We have to have that be part of our life. And Lord, there's so much more for our lives that you have in store. And first and foremost, Lord, I want to ask and I pray, Jesus, that you would boldly bring vision to each one of us about where our relationship with you is. Lord, that we would be mindful and we would seek first your kingdom, not our own wants and desires, but yours for our life. Jesus, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us And Lord, we thank you, and I just want to pray that you would give us the courage and the ability to walk towards the picture you have for each one of us. We thank you for this morning, and we pray all of this through the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, as we conclude this morning, I would invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn. Uh, Thank you, orchestra, choir, team, for a wonderful way to worship our Heavenly Father today. Uh, As a quick reminder, we have an opportunity for vacation Bible sign-ups. The Ringenbergs are going to be back there talking about Mission Aviation Fellowship. Highly recommend you stop and check them out. Uh, Right after this benediction, we are going to have a wonderful postlude. I would invite you to encourage you to sit down and enjoy that in just a moment. And a quick reminder that next week we will only have one service at 10 a.m. 
Put it in your calendar and uh, get ready for a wonderful barbecue and celebration next week. But for now, receive our Lord's blessing. And now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and bring you peace as each one of us go out into this world discovering God's wonderful, personal, pleasing, perfect will for our lives. So may the Lord bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great rest of your weekend. Enjoy this wonderful postlude.